Good morning, everybody. Please forgive me. I was talking uh, to Mark Plotkin about George Washington University basketball. <laughs> All right. Well, again, good morning. Uh, today, I am here to uh, deliver on a promise that I made in July to, uh, 2012 uh, when I released the One City uh, Action Plan. Uh, the promise was to make, a, uh, to make the plan a living document and that it uh, serve as a tool for uh, district residents to keep uh, our administration uh, accountable. Uh, as you may recall, the One City Action Plan is the result of bringing together almost 2,000 residents. Some of you will recall because many of you were there uh, at the uh, convention center when we did the uh, summit. Uh, but anyway, we had 2,000 residents who came together and participated in the One City Summit in February of 2012. Uh, immediately following the summit, I promised district residents that I would share specifically uh, how my administration would work to move the city f uh, forward uh, and toward becoming uh, one city. The plan not only combined uh, the invaluable information gathered from the summit, and I think you're getting copies of uh, the plan again uh, today, um, but also uh, months upon months of feedback that was garnered from community meetings and one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with constituents and community leaders. Uh, this information was ultimately developed into the One City Action Plan, which is the document, again, that's being uh, disseminated. Um, this morning, I'm delighted to introduce the One City Action Plan website, which can be found at onecityactionplan.dc.gov. Uh, that should be pretty easy to remember, shouldn't it, Mark? Guess he's not. Oh, yeah. Go right, go right ahead, Mark. <laughs> the website was built to mirror uh, the One City Action Plan document. It includes updates on each of the uh, 66 action items and 19 long-term uh, indicators. Uh, in addition to a status update uh, on each action item, the action items are labeled uh, as completed, on target, or delayed. And I'm really pleased uh, with the progress that we've made uh, over the past eight months. Of the 66 action items, nine have been completed uh, already, 55 are on track, and only two uh, are delayed. And I'm sure you're wondering what are the two, right? Uh, one is the uh, installing of smart meters in all DC taxi cabs and then converting all street lights to energy efficient LED bulbs uh, are the two that are delayed. Uh, frankly, both are delayed because of inefficiencies in procurement. Uh, and I think you may know that we're working to, f to uh, fix our procurement system. I mentioned that in the uh, State of the District address. And uh, we're already uh, starting to work uh, on that effort. Uh, I think procurement has been a uh, problem for the last 47 decades uh, in the District of Columbia. But like other things, we're determined uh, to be able to fix that one uh, as well. Um, the website will be updated quarterly, and I want to encourage uh, all residents to track our progress as we work toward uh, becoming one city. All right, let me move on to the next uh, topic now, and that is our CBE advisory uh, group. Uh, let me turn to, just hold on one second, let me make sure I've got all the information that I need. Okay, um, the um, CBE issue has to deal with our continuing quest uh, to reform the District of Columbia uh, government in the area of our uh, certified business enterprise uh, efforts. Uh, again, as I stated in the One City Action Plan, uh, building resilient, diversified, small and local businesses is a critical uh, part of my strategy for developing a new economy in the District of Columbia, an economy that is less dependent on the federal government, and we're really working hard on that because we've done a lot of work alone uh, in the area of uh, technology. Um, so I'm announcing the next steps uh, in an ongoing commitment to uh, achieve serious and lasting reforms to the city's certified business enterprise CBE uh, program. 
I have appointed a CBE advisory group, uh, a panel of 17 prominent uh, business leaders from the uh, development, construction, finance, and other industries who will advise me and pertinent agency leaders as we prepare new legislation to reform the CBE program. Um, I'm going to ask uh, those who are here, I don't know that everybody's here, but those who are here, if they would come up uh, to the front. Pretty good number. Uh, you may recall in October that I announced, uh, with the support of members of the business community, a comprehensive package of reforms to improve CBE, uh, the CBE program, and to address deficiencies that uh, long preceded uh, us. Uh, earlier this month, I found it necessary to uh, veto council legislation that failed to adequately address some of these long-standing issues. I believe the measure included uh, unworkable provisions, as I said in the letter that I transmitted, uh, provisions that would exacerbate uh, existing uh, problems, that would fail to do enough to prevent the misuse of the CBE program and increase costs to the District of Columbia. Moreover, it generated substantial opposition from the CBE community. Uh, with that said, um, I still uh, applaud it and I continue to applaud the Council's attempt to accomplish many of our shared goals and urge members to work with me to enact legislation that is workable, effective, and that would be broadly accepted uh, across the uh, city. Today, with shared goals in mind, I introduced the CBE Advisory Group uh, to provide expert input as we craft a legislative package that will strengthen the program. Um, I have enormous faith uh, in this group uh, of people who are highly accomplished and on so many occasions have committed themselves uh, to work uh, with the city. Um, they represent, again, a cross-section of the district's business community, and they will provide uh, our administration with immense help in assuring uh, that we achieve the goal of building our uh, small and local business uh, community here in the city. While informal in nature, the advisory group will inform the public uh, of their meetings uh, and open them to the public. Margaret Single, Singleton, who is the Vice President and Executive Director of the D.C. Chamber uh, of Commerce, uh, has graciously agreed to chair this group. She's done a lot for this city over the years, and I uh, called upon her again, and I thank her for her uh, gracious acceptance uh, of the opportunity uh, to do this. So. Before we go any further, I want to uh, take the opportunity to give Margaret a, a chance to say a few words uh, about uh, how she will proceed on this. I'm sure she doesn't have a keynote speech prepared since she only found out about this uh, recently, but knowing Margaret, she'll uh, be able to do well uh, on her feet. So, Margaret. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning. And thank you, Mr. Mayor for the appointment as chair of the CBE advisory group. I am grateful to have to serve and, and honored, and I am also mindful of the importance of the work that we have ahead of us. Since its inception, the CBE program has aimed to level the playing field for those small and local businesses who decided to reside in the District of Columbia. These employers contribute to the city's tax base, hire district residents, and enrich our local communities. A strong business base is essential to maintaining and creating quality jobs that will expand the district's middle class and expand our economy. As the CBE advisory group, we will endeavor to enhance the proposed legislation through thoughtful discussions and recommendations to you that can bring real opportunities for economic impact in the city. The continuous efforts to improve the CBE program over the years, I think, reflects the desire for the D.C. community to ensure the evolution of one of the most progressive local inclusion programs in the United States. This aligns with your ec economic strategy goal to establish the district as the most business-friendly economy in the nation. At the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, where I work, we are encouraged by the establishment of the advisory group and look forward to a CBE structure that helps businesses grow by gaining access to capital and fostering cash flow expeditiously. In closing, 
I want to thank my fellow members in advance for their collaboration as we work toward achieving a result that is a beneficial proposition for the CBE, business community, and the residents of the District of Columbia. Thank you. We're going to have a five-minute speech now from each one of the members. <laughs> now, I want to thank each of you for your willingness to do this. I, I wanted the public to see who has agreed to work on this, and this is obviously a sterling, uh, very capable group. So, uh, if you all have any questions for them, wait until we finish. You know, uh, we got one more. We got one more. We got one more to do, and we'll come back to it, Mark. Okay. Thank you, guys. Could, could they introduce themselves? <laughs> <laughs> You, you don't know who those people are. I don't know every one of them. I'd like to know the ones I don't know. Sure, I'm Brad Fennell with W.C. Smith. Chair Lynch from Chair Lynch and Chair Lynch and Chair Lynch. I'm Merrick Malone with the Rose Bond Group. I'm Rod Woodson with Holland and Knight. Luke Cromie with Kilberg Signs. Daryl McKissick with McKissick and McKissick. Uh, Ernie Jarvis, First Potomac Realty Trust, President of DCBIA. Loretta Caldwell, L.S. Caldwell and Associates. Alberto Gomez, Prince Construction Company. Bill also has. Natalie Ludaway, the law firm of Ludwich and Ludaway. Mr. Manglemeyer, WCS Construction. Uh, Adrian Washington, Neighborhood Development Company. Pedro Alfonso, Dynamic Concepts Inc. And I'm Vince Gray. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Uh, the last thing I want to mention before we get to uh, questions this morning uh, is that I am honored to launch a first in the District of Columbia uh, today. I am delighted to announce the Patricia Pat Handy Award in memory of uh, Patricia Renee Handy, who gave more than 30 years of service to the District of Columbia. And anybody that knew Pat, uh, you understand why we are uh, doing this. Um, the award recipient will be a D.C. government employee who goes above and beyond the call of duty uh, to help district residents. Uh, he or she is singled out because, like uh, Pat Handy, uh, has demonstrated unique leadership, dedication, uh, a dedication to providing excellent public service, uh, as well as a commitment to improving the quality of life of District uh, of Columbia uh, residents. Uh, at the time of her sudden passing, at the age of 60, uh, which was just on this past November 20th, uh, 2012, uh, Pat was the homeless coordinator on the family services uh, in the Family Services Administration uh, in the Department of Human Services, and I'm glad that uh, David Burns and uh, and Fred are uh, here today uh, to be a part of it because they worked with her virtually uh, on a daily uh, basis. Uh, Pat was a native Washingtonian and is remembered for her leadership skills, dedication, and commitment uh, to people uh, who are homeless. Uh, also, her positive attitude earned the respect and admiration of those who worked with her uh, on a daily basis. Uh, let me just tell you something about the first recipient of the Pat Handy Award. Uh, and I think this is somewhat of a surprise uh, to her, or is it him? Our first awardee is known for her ability to connect agencies together uh, for the benefit of vulnerable uh, residents. The recipient personally invests countless hours and energy, uh, even outside of work hours, to meet the needs of residents. She has been a district government employee for two years and a D.C. resident for more than 20 years. Uh, prior to joining the D.C. government, she spent several years working in the nonprofit sector. Our recipient has been closely involved in education reform efforts since the early 1990s when, as a law student at the University of the District of Columbia, uh, <laughs> we have anybody that fits that description? <laughs> Well, you had to know we were going to get to something that would give it away, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. As a law student at Howard University, <laughs> no, at UDC, she began working with adjudicated youth. Her interest in education 
and advocacy uh, deepened after she and her husband officially became foster parents to a 15-year-old and uh, unofficially to several other teenagers. She has spent her career doing policy and advocacy work focusing on at-risk youth, uh, English language learner students, uh, school choice, and uh, civil rights. The awardee has been described as a compassionate, smart, strategic colleague. She wears many hats at her agency, including being a leader uh, of the service uh, members to veterans and uh, to service members, veterans, and their families uh, work group. Uh, and also the hoarding task force moving agencies to work together to uh, help residents in precarious situations. Um, I focused on this employee after I received an email uh, from a DC resident uh, who's currently on active duty in Afghanistan. Uh, he wrote the following and I quote, what she and a volunteer did is pretty spectacular. They uh, came to the aid of a senior resident who had no family and was sleeping in her car because her house was unlivable due to a hoarding condition which all the neighbors uh, complained about. Uh, the two identified a multifaceted, multi-agency approach to humanely address the issue uh, by securing funding to bring the pro property up to code, identifying mental health care which the senior resident had lost after she stopped working and with a pool of very committed volunteers, helped the lady re-enter her home. The email went on to say, again, and I quote, this is a story about compassionate intervention, about Washingtonians caring uh, for a senior citizen uh, whose society had forgotten. But more importantly, their collective efforts highlight an approach to humanely address a growing problem with people who are elderly in our community, unquote. The email was written by a serviceman uh, who lived next door to Marilyn Templeton, uh, the senior who needed help. And I want to thank Joby uh, Gorchoff, uh, who is the volunteer from the uh, Tales High Cat Rescue Group, who helped Mrs. Templeton, uh, both, and both of them uh, may be here today. I, don't, I know one of them is here today. <laughs> I don't know about Joby. Uh, in any event, the employee praised in the email has earned the admiration and respect of her peers thereby embodying the spirit of the award's uh, namesake. And as we present the award, Pat's father is here uh, today, and I'm going to ask Dr. Handy if he would come up uh, and join me uh, as we present uh, this award, the first Pat Handy Award, and it won't be, it won't be the last. How are you today, sir? Fine, thank you. Um, I'm really proud to present this award to somebody who I've actually known for several years. Uh, I used to, when I was the chair of the uh, council, I would do um, youth hearings on Saturday mornings, and uh, she would uh, characteristically bring a group of young people down uh, to participate uh, in the hearings. Anyway, please join me in uh, saying thanks to Ariana Quinones. Okay, I just told the mayor, you all, you got me. <laughs> this is uh, definitely a surprise. Um, I, I never expected this. I mean, really, I feel like I, I've been doing my job. So um, that's, that's, you know, primary focus of our office is interagency coordination and, and these um, hoarding efforts definitely take that and most of the work that we do takes, you know, all of the directors and staff of the agencies within our cluster and, and, and within the other clusters, across the other clusters in, in government. So I've been fortunate to work with some really great people and I have to recognize Joby who's been, you know, she's a, a just a, a, been a volunteer and really, really stepped up to the plate to help this one particular resident. <coughs> Um, and some of the other, fire and EMS, um, Tommy Rucker, who on her own time, she's one of the chief fire inspectors, was coming out with her family to help clean up this particular home. Um, Fred Hill from DHCD, who's just really been amazing and in one case waited at a constituent's home until her daughter came home because the mom had a, a bit of dementia, didn't want to leave her there alone. So there are so many examples of government employees that just step up. So I, I feel like I'm part of a great team. 
So thank you, and, and this is a special honor that it's um, in the name of Pat Handy, who's just an amazing, amazing woman and, and an inspiration to me and, and many others. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Handy. Thank you. Would you like to say something, Dr. Handy? Uh, well, uh, good morning. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to Mayor first because um, he surprised me uh, at the, upon the onset of my daughter's death, which, which was unexpected. And uh, he called and wanted to, well, I'm sorry, he, he asked Mr. Cook here, uh, Mr. Swan, Fred Swan here, uh, if I would talk to him if I would talk to the mayor. <laughs> so I said, Fred, certainly I'll be happy. And then he went on to explain to me how personally he knew my daughter. In fact, I learned the day of the funeral how personally so many officials in Washington, D.C. knew my daughter. Now, I knew she knew uh, people who needed help and intervened. Uh, the mayor mentioned compassionate intervention uh, in terms of his award, and uh, that sort of personified Patty. Well, at any rate, uh, at the funeral, uh, the mayor spoke, uh, Mr. Graham spoke, uh, Mr. Wells spoke, uh, uh, Ms. Alexander spoke, and Ms. Alexander's father and I had been ex good friends for life tennis players, and uh, obviously, Oh, those days are over for me. But, <laughs> but at any rate, um, it was just a wonderful day uh, of praise for Patty. And so I want to take this opportunity to just thank you because I really appreciated the efforts you made. And, and I know you, weren't, you, you did not uh, commandeer these other folks together. I'm sure they did it on their own. And... Uh, so I'm happy that all of them participated. So my dear, uh, I'm sure that you will step into the shoes of Patty Handy <laughs> with your compassionate intervention and do an excellent job. So congratulations to you. Thanks. All right, thanks. There will be other occasions. We don't have a specific timetable or a specific number or a specific anything with this. There will be other occasions when the uh, Patricia R. Handy Award will be, um, will be accorded. Uh, and it will be circumstances like you just heard about uh, with Ariana uh, when the award will be uh, given. Uh, and that's the kind of work that, that uh, Pat Handy did. Uh, to be able to um, to move people to a different place in life. I don't know how to put it any more succinctly or uh, directly than that. And again, I want to thank uh, David. I want to thank Fred uh, for being here because they worked with her uh, every day and certainly know um, firsthand uh, the kind of work and the kind of compassion that she brought to her, uh, her position. All right, uh, we had three topics that we talked about uh, today. We had the One City Action Plan and the new website uh, that we have developed. Uh, we talked about the CBE group, and uh, Mark, of course, already got his question in on that one. And then we talked about the awards, so I'll be happy to take questions on any uh, or all uh, of those subjects. Alan. I, I don't know. I'll ask Harold if he can answer that. But I think you know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure, Alan, knowing you, that you thoroughly read the letter uh, that we sent back. 
vetoing the legislation. Uh, and there were a number of things that we had requested that were in the legislation. On the other hand, there were things in the legislation that we felt made it unworkable, um, you know, like terms that were used for which there was no definition or um, increasing the percentage, the requirement from 35 to 50 percent by industry, by trade, by division, you know, whatever one wants to, to you know, use, which we felt would have, would have made it in some areas almost impossible to be able to find any significant number of, uh, you know, of firms, uh, entities that do that work to be able to achieve that level. And it would have probably resulted in increasing, in increasing the prices uh, of work uh, here in the city. Uh, and then the, the way the preference points were uh, reallocated uh, in the legislation. So we've asked those because a, a lot of the people that you heard from are people who were concerned uh, themselves about the legislation. I think I heard from more people with respect to this legislation than I heard, have heard from many. Uh, so uh, it just seemed appropriate because I think we probably would have wound up in litigation before very long around some of the terminology uh, that was being used for which there was no definition. And it would have been virtually impossible uh, to ascertain exactly what the government meant uh, in those circumstances. So again, a number of the things that I had wanted were in there, but there were so many other things that were in there that made the legislation unworkable. And that's why we are back uh, to the drawing board. And by the way, this will not go on forever. Uh, I know Margaret, she's a taskmaster. and. Uh, I would suspect within about 60 days uh, we'll have something that can be uh, reintroduced. Uh, now, you asked about spot checks. Uh, do you know, Harold? Sure. Okay. The, uh, one of the linchpins of the, of the uh, CB reform efforts, uh, aside from the specific initiatives within it, was simply uh, to put a team in place. I think largely, uh, as everyone knows, the program had been historically under-resourced uh, with the people and the right teams in place uh, to actually carry out the work. Uh, so much of that, Alan, was uh, uh, first getting the manpower in place. It's like being charged with digging a ditch but having no team nor shovel to do it. Uh, so much of it is first putting the manpower in place which by the end of April we'll have half of the team uh, put in place and we'll begin doing that work. Uh, I do want to uh, certainly note uh, that was one of the quick actions of the mayor uh, to, for us to identify what the work, uh, the, the manpower levels that are needed for the program uh, and certainly the mayor's quick actions to uh, get the department the resources needed. Uh, from that standpoint, putting budget in place, going through the HR process, and doing those certain steps have led us to where we are today. Uh, so once we have, uh, we have, we'll have half the team in place, um, and then as we get into the, cup, the next couple of months, uh, we'll have a full team in place, uh, certainly by the end of this fiscal year. No, I'm not satisfied with it. I'm not satisfied with the legislation that came forward. That's why we here. <coughs> well, let me finish, Alan. I'll let you finish your question. Excuse me? Well, how do you think I'm going to get distracted? Oh, you asked me a question, so I'm answering it. The question was, am I satisfied with the pace? And the answer is no. Uh, if I could refine my question, the specific pace of him, of Mr. Pettigrew, uh, staffing up and, and, and doing these spot checks. I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the pace of the entire effort. We had expected to be at another place uh, at this point. And by the way, we not only have manpower, we have woman power. Uh, also that, that we're uh, involved with this program, as you can well see. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is we expect it to be at a different place uh, at this point. We're not. And we're, uh, we went back to the drawing board re reluctantly, um, and we expect to come back with a piece of legislation that will be sound, that will reflect the things that we hope to be able to achieve and that won't be challenged in the aftermath. I frankly think if we had gone forward with the bill that we had, uh, and again, I appreciate the work of the council on this, but I think we would have gotten slowed down at a, a later point. So this is an effort to try to, um, to, to redo uh, the bill in a way that will be sound, uh, will be legally sufficient, to use one of those terms, um, and hopefully we'll get it done quickly. Ms. Brazil. Advised you, and what was 
the thought process in terms of uh, these 17 individuals being appointed to the council? What were you looking for? Or what was your goal? Um, looking for people who really brought some expertise and interest and commitment uh, to the issue. Uh, some of them, in one way or the other, expressed views uh, about the legislation. Um, they had been involved in the CBE program in one way or the other for some time. But people who we, we knew uh, had some expertise in this and um, had a commitment to trying to see that the CBE program uh, improved as, as much as we possibly could. Very few of them have what I would consider clean hands. And whether or not it's articles that have been in city paper or in the Washington Post or what have you, over the years, uh, many of these have been what I would call some of the worst actors benefiting from the, the problems in the CBE program. Uh, and along those lines, had you thought of not having people who are currently using the CBE program, but maybe some outside experts, people who don't have contracts, for example, with DGS or the district government, who might give you some insight as to uh, industry standard or best practices across the nation? Well, clearly, I, I have a, a very positive view uh, of the people who have agreed to participate. Uh, they are an advisory body in an informal sense, so anybody who wishes to weigh in once we finish this work will be welcome to do that. But I heartily appreciate the fact that they've stepped up uh, and agreed to do this. They all are uh, hugely qualified people who work very hard every day and don't have a lot of hours to give to other things at this stage. So I want to publicly thank them uh, for agreeing uh, to do this. And I'm sure that they will reach out to others uh, along the way. Uh, Margaret is noted for being able to do that. So uh, I'm satisfied with the group that we have, uh, especially recognizing that there will be opportunities for anybody who wishes to to provide input. Don't you think it would have been a help to get someone who um, knows best practices and long lines across the nation or someone who quite frankly, isn't a contractor or someone seeking a contract with the district government or has been what I call a bad actor um, in the CTE program of, of the past? Ms. Brazil, if you have somebody you want to recommend, let me know. The door is wide open. Well, you're not worried about any potential conflicts of interest? I mean, Ms. McKissick, her, her firm, and Ms. Ludaway, they work for DGS. DGS, has, there's been numerous problems with the CBE program there. Um, Mr. Woodson represents Forrester Construction. It's a lobbyist for Forrester, which the city attorney general is currently investigating. Um, I think Holland tonight has also represented Siegel, which Councilmember Orange has asked the inspector general to investigate. I mean, these people are in the thick of, um, of a lot of the problems with the CBE program. They also are people. They also are people who know the program, Alan. And I'm comfortable with the fact. Well, I'm, I'm responding to what you said. I'm comfortable with them serving on an informal advisory body, which this is. Um, at the end of the day, the legislation will be mine that's transmitted, not theirs. It will be mine. But it seems pretty, pretty tilted towards the larger contractors and their interests. Well, I think you also know the bill that I put together earlier, too. So you know what my principles are, what I'm interested in. And um, I think it was a pretty good bill uh, that was, uh, was introduced earlier. And, we probably won't stray, you know, far from that. Any other? Yes. Well, we're on these three that are the subject of the press briefing. Uh, if anybody has any other questions on the CBE group, on the One City Action Plan, on the uh, Pat Handy <coughs> Award. You have any questions on the Pat Handy Award? You think it's great? Please write that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on that? If you all would like to stay, you're welcome to. If not, uh, you've been properly disparaged. So. <laughs> Mark. Uh, on Saturday, uh, Muriel Bowser, I think you're familiar with the name. So you're on to the next subject yeah, now, right? Okay. Uh, announcing for mayor. Um, I've known you for a long time. And uh, one of the reasons, besides your goal to be in public service, I think, was you weren't exactly the president of the fan club of Adrian Fenton. I think that motivated you to run. 
Uh, I don't think you're a president, and she's not a president of your fan club. Uh, for mayor, will the will the idea that Bowser is running and your personal um, feelings toward her uh, affect your decision uh, to run for mayor for a second term? And second, is there a deadline that you've imposed on yourself? The Democratic primary is April of next year. Um, Tommy Wells, Jack Evans are talking about running. Um, so that's a typical two-part question. Your feelings about Muriel Bowser, and second, um, if you do you have a self-imposed deadline of telling the, uh, the D.C. public what your intentions are? The answer to the first question is no. The answer to the second question is no. April of next year, I guess. I, I, I'm not going to engage in any evaluation or analysis of Councilmember Bowser at this stage. I'm focused on doing my job every day, and we will continue to do that. I think we have a pretty sterling record uh, that we've amassed in the 16 to 17 months that we've been in office, or was it 26 to 27 months, excuse me, whatever number of months it is. And, um, you know, we'll continue to build on that record and we'll continue to talk about that record. Yes. Um, well, Paul, I think you know that I've asked the deputy mayor, uh, who happens to be ill today, that's why he's not here. Um, I've asked him to uh, conduct a review uh, of a number of issues in FMES. Uh, the report will be out this week. Uh, it probably would have been out today if he hadn't uh, taken ill, but will be out before the end of the week. And I think I'd rather wait until we get the report, and then we'll address additional questions then. Well, it'll look at a number of issues, as you know, because you followed this stuff pretty closely. It'll look at a number of issues that may be illustrative of anything that may be larger. Do you want to comment now on what your concern is on state readiness for this fire No, I want to wait until we get the report. I didn't leak it. Uh, no, I didn't leak any report. That's what I'm saying. I'm sorry. No, I haven't seen it. I have not. Well, certainly there are citizens out there asking if there are, are ambulance units who are taking themselves out of service legitimately or not that risk the public safety of risk. Let, let me try this again, Mark. I would like the deputy mayor to have an opportunity to present his report, and then we'll go from there. Do you think the fire department is being adequately funded? I think it's being adequately funded. Somebody suggested it's not being adequately funded. If somebody talks about a vacancy, Ben, that means that the position is funded. It's just not filled. That's not a funding issue. Well, is it a hiring issue then? Maybe. I don't know. Let's wait and see what the report says. Mark? Uh, on another issue, I understand tomorrow you're meeting with Senator Carper of Delaware. Uh, Senator Carper is the lead sponsor of the statehood bill. I've asked you this question before, but I'd like you to be a little more specific. There are three other co-sponsors, Murray, Durbin, and uh, Boxer. Uh, you've said, and I wonder if you're going to ask Senator Carper tomorrow to move the statehood bill actually in his committee. Uh, Senator Glenn uh, had it in his committee 20 years ago and it never moved. And whether you're in favor of a strategy uh, to have a vote on the bill, Senator Reid, majority leader, is for statehood. Uh, or is this just a symbolic four senators? sponsoring statehood and it doesn't go anywhere. What is the level of involvement that you're going to ask Senator Carper and what is the strategy behind this? Well, of course, I hope it uh, moves. I hope that the bill is voted upon. Um, I think you know my commitment, Mark. I, I can't imagine. You're not asking that question, are you? No, I'm not. I'm yeah. You, yeah. What are you going to ask Senator Carper? Well, I'm going to ask him to do everything possible to move the issue uh, forward. I'm very appreciative of the fact that he has stepped up 
um, to be an advocate uh, for the District of Columbia. I appreciate the other senators having, you know, Senator Durbin, Senator Murray, and Senator uh, Boxer also for having stepped up. You know, I don't want to suggest that it looks like we're really getting some momentum, but, you know, to have four senators having signed on to this, uh, and then we'll work as, as hard as we can to get others to sign on. I was, a few weeks ago, Sheila and I were walking, walking down 7th Street, and, we, and I had a gentleman walk up to me, just took a card out of his pocket, and he said, Hi, I'm a representative. I'm a member of the House of Representatives from Michigan, and I just want to let you know that I'm with you guys. What, what, what was it, uh, Sheila? We'll get the name for you, Mark. Yeah, we'll get, uh, there are 436, okay? <laughs> no, there's 436. <laughs> yes, and I happen to count her as a member of the House of Representatives. I do too. Uh, my question, a little more refinement, is obviously you're aware, and everyone's aware, that Republicans control the House. They're not going to bring up this bill. Are you for bringing up the bill in the Senate, even though it will? It will. It could pass the 55 Democratic senators. Uh, it's never been brought up in the Senate. Even if it loses, are you for uh, it, it loses? That is, they don't get 60 votes for cloture, or they don't get 55 votes for it. Are you for bringing it up, uh, even though it might, or a vote, even though it might lose? I'm for anything that will advance our cause. And I don't think losing a vote is a loss necessarily because it elevates the issue. It gets people, you know, talking about it. Uh, we knew we'd have to be in this for the long haul, and uh, we will be in it for the long haul. Uh, again, I'm I'm really excited um, about the fact that we we're getting this far, Mark. I'm I'm excited about, you know, the fact that more and more people are paying attention to the D.C. flag. Some of these little things are going to build uh, momentum, and there will come a tipping point. Uh, I don't know what day that will be. No one knows, of course. But the only way we can advance this is to continue to uh, continue to discuss the issues and work with those who are advocates and try to convince those who may be on the fence that they ought to be uh, more involved with us to be able to advance the cause of justice and democracy uh, here in the District of Columbia. Ms. Brazil. Um, with regard to your work city action plan, you indicated that um, projects in D.C. were pretty much on target, except for two, the, um, the taxi cabs and the street lights. Um, I'm flipping through your action plan now. Was the undergrounding of power lines and the uh, effort to improve reliability of electrical service one of your action plan items? I don't think it was. I don't think it was, no. I think this is something that we got into after the rate show uh, last year. We recognized that you know, once again, uh, we had a reliability question that was being raised. You know, obviously we don't run the power company, but it's our residents who are affected by this. And so I and our administration just stepped into the breach uh, to say, look, we need to provide some la leadership here. Uh, you probably will recall I said we need a game changer uh, on this issue. I don't mean to be flipping, but we'll get the report when they're finished. Uh, it's a very complicated, complex uh, issue. Um, I do think that they're making progress. This is an issue like, you know, like others that have never been tackled by this government uh, before. Uh, we're continuing to work on it. I, I don't know. I won't, I won't uh, propose a date because I don't know that anyone has a date uh, at this stage as to when it will be available. Uh, you will recall that we took on yet another issue, and that was the Bloomingdale flooding issue that had been a century, uh, had been around for a century. We took it on. And we found a solution to that. And uh, we're going to try to keep everybody at the table uh, to be able to find a solution to this one as well. There are a lot of different interests in this. You know, you've got the uh, PEPCO, obviously. You've got the Public Service Commission. You've got the People's Council. You've got uh, people of the District of Columbia. You've got the District of Columbia government. Hugely complicated issue. And um, the fact that the conversations have gone on and have gone on as constructively as they have 
uh, I think bodes well for us, even though we don't have a solution uh, as yet. There is widespread agreement among the members of the task force that needs of what needs to be done. The issue is paying for it. And the recalcitrant uh, member of the task force and the key player is Petro. Uh, have you gotten such a report back? Uh, no. No, and PEPCO has been at the table at every one of these meetings. We've had innumerable discussions with them. Um, and, of course, they, they have interests just like everybody else does uh, at the table. But they are continuing to work with us, and, and uh, I appreciate the fact that they are. Again, we, we, I think everybody recognizes that we don't run PEPCO, we don't run the power company, but the people of the city are, um, every time we have a power outage, there are lots of people who are affected. And just so everybody knows, uh, every time there's been a power outage, I personally have been affected. In fact, when the derecho uh, occurred, I was out for five days uh, during that period. So I know firsthand the inconvenience uh, that is experienced by people as a result of it. And we're going to continue working at this to try to find a solution. Matt. I can until the investigation is completed. Uh, I've been to Tyler House many times. Uh, since not since the shooting. I've been to Tyler House many times. I wanted to let the investigation continue and unfold. Did not want to get in the middle of that because the chief is conducting that investigation. But I'll be more than happy to sit down with people in the aftermath of it so we can talk about what the findings are. But, I, you know, people are going to ask me all kinds of questions, as you might imagine, associated with uh, the incident. And I would rather not have to say, there's an investigation going on, I can't say anything. I'd rather go when I can really talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say yet. I want to wait till the report comes out. But I think I think we I believe that there are other issues that have been there for a while that we will you know we will we'll, we will work on. Um, you know, for example, being able to change the, the deployment of ambulances um, is an issue that has been around for ages. And of course, it was your paper, you know, that ran the editorial that said the chief ought to have the authority uh, to be able to deploy ambulances in the most nimble uh, way. I happen to agree with that. I mean, I, I, I draw an analogy to Chief Lanier when she, when she recognized last year that we were having, a, you know, an increase in robberies in the city. So she put together the robbery intervention uh, program um, that deployed officers in a different way. If she had had to go to the council and spend weeks and months waiting for uh, approval for that, it really would have eroded her ability to be able to fight crime, which nobody would have been happy with. So. Um, there may be some other issues and other recommendations that will be forthcoming associated with long-standing uh, challenges in the fire department. Issue I heard from the council took issue with the editorial was that, you know, you know, fine, you can be against the council having this power to approve the shift schedule, but they haven't gotten a proposal from the chief or from your administration. Do you know when they're going to send that down uh, for the council's approval? No, let's wait till the deputy mayor is back from his illness and uh, he'll address that, Mike. Mayor Gray, can you tell us what else this report or this review is looking at? You said it, it goes beyond just the incident with the officer. No, I, I was responding to Mike's question if I thought there might be other issues that would be uh, addressed or discussed in the course of this discussion. That was my, uh, I'm not suggesting that all of this will be addressed in that report. But the, the uh, discussion may transcend um, just what's in this report. So, uh, well, to clarify, Mr. Mayor, the, the report that Mr. Corner is working on, our understanding of it was, it was just on the response to the EMS and Officer Hickman. Are you saying that there's other issues that, that 
he's been looking into that's going to be in this report as well? Well, he's the deputy mayor, Paul, um, and he's got he's got this within his purview on a daily basis. I have not seen a report. I've not seen the draft of a report. I've not seen one sentence associated with the report. So I don't know how far I will go. But I was responding to the question of whether I thought there would be other issues in the course of this that would be discussed. And if that's the question, then my answer is yes, because there are other issues. You all know that. Thank you very much.